Hello, King's Chapels, I love you. I just wanted to start with that. This is a love letter on video. I also want to tell you how much I love and appreciate Dr. Jim Rocco, one of my best friends in all of my career. I dearly love the whole family. Today, I want to take especially take time to say thank you to all of our first responders. That will also, for my sake, I want to include the military. I thank God for the troops that fought abroad and continue to in places we don't even know about. Thank God there's those that are willing to put their life on the line, for there is no greater love than a man lay down his life for his friends. In doing so, I also want you to understand that those that secure freedom abroad would have wasted their time if that freedom cannot be secured at home. And thank you, law enforcement. Your first response, it's not to run when the bullets fly. You run to the battle, not from the battle. And because of you, we are a nation in safety. And today we know all those weird voices out there want to talk about defunding the police. Well, that's really fine until they get in trouble, right? So I want all of our law enforcement to know our love and appreciation for you. And these things I'm mentioning are not listed in order of priority. How can I say one group is greater or better or more important than the other? So I want to include our EMTs, our paramedics, our doctors and nurses on the front line fighting this drastic pandemic throughout the world. Thank you, all of you. And there's some thoughts I'd like to bring to your attention in doing so. As a, I don't even know what to call myself in light of, I, you responded to me. And I'll put it this way. When that helicopter came in to pick me up on the bank of that river in Vietnam, I didn't care what color it was. I didn't care what was on the side of it, what guns they carried. They didn't carry guns. They only had a red cross on the side of it. And believe me, the enemy did not give any free lessons on that. They shot at everything that had anything America to it. So I'm going to tell you, they came in under fire, and they're called Dust Off, and it's a medical helicopter, and they picked me up. And those wonderful medics, with all the training you folks in this room and the rooms around the country, you know what I'm talking about. That training is so intense and so difficult, so stressful to go through to learn but that stress doesn't go away because you got through the course. It reoccurs every time you are called into action. And what happens is you get into this looping, the ideas and the remembrance and the thoughts, and the, it starts going over. And they, they call that post-traumatic stress disorder. And so to fight some of those things, I think one of the better values we have and tools to fight it is to remember the Word of God. The greatest value I'll ever add to anything I say comes from the Word of God. And there's a scripture that comes out of Psalm. It's Psalm 84, and I think you'll like this. It's the fifth verse. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the highways to heaven, who passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one, all of them appear before God, in Zion. I can't, I can't dissect every verse of it for time's sake, but let me take the high points that are so meaningful. I think this is going to have great impact in your life, not because I said it, but because the Word of God said it. There's something about this opening statement. It says, blessed is the man whose strength is in thee. Is your strength in the Lord? If it is, you are absolutely indefeatable. You cannot be taken down because when it's his strength, who shall defeat God? So blessed is man whose strength is in God. In his heart is a highway to heaven. One scripture, uh, I guess you call it translation, says their heart is set on pilgrimage. So we're going from one point to another, but it goes through a place called Baca, a valley called Baca. A valley is a place that's a depression. That's called a valley. The valley is where most people get depressed. I want to talk to you a little bit about this valley of Baca. First of all, let's just discover what Baca means. The word Baca means tears or sorrow or suffering or pain. That very negative part of the human existence that whenever we're tried by fire, oh my goodness, it's so it's easier to quit than to stay. 
except in quitting, you are defeated. And that's never easier than victory, ultimately. So to get ultimate victory, passing through the valley of sorrow, we need to find out what, what's the ingredient, what's the formula. Well, I personally applied the formula that I know will work for you because it worked for me. And you, me, we're no different. We're, made, we're cut from the same cloth of humanity. So here's what we've discovered so far. The blessed man has his strength in God. And as he goes through life, he comes to a place of great sorrow and depression. Worldwide, you don't have to go somewhere else to find it. It's wherever you are in this world. It's depressed right now. A panic of pandemic has replaced faith with fear. Faith is the opposite of fear. The Bible says in many times, someone actually tried to add them up. There's different numbers that come up in the total edition, but it's hundreds of times the Bible says, fear not. And the same number of times it says, fear not, immediately following is, for I am with thee. So in the middle of a pandemic, let's not panic because God is with us. And I always have a little fun with it. If we can get through COVID-1 through 18, I guess we can get through COVID-19. I don't even know what those numbers mean, so it shows my ignorance, doesn't it? But the fact is, I've been through my 1 through 19. I've been through my COVIDs of life. I've been through the times when panic was much, much easier than sitting back and letting God take control because I thought I had to control it. Faith is in God first. And you have to have a little faith in yourself too. So I'm going to take you to the riverbank in Vietnam. And all you first responders, you'll find yourself in this picture wondering what you would have done to save the life of yours truly speaking to you right now. It was July of 1969. And for all the young people in the room, I know you think that's right after the War of 1812, but eh, not so. This yesterday, this is yesterday. I mean, not yesteryear even. Yesterday, why, why would it be that fresh in my memory? The pain started that day, and this day, over 50 years later, it still hurts. I've had 60 operations, counting only those where they put me to sleep. On operation number 50, they took my whole face apart. This was three years ago. For those of you that haven't seen me in the last 36 months or so, well, let me just reintroduce my beautiful self. I have a nose now. I'm so proud of it. I had this little piece of a nose and it wasn't enough to sustain oxygen getting into my system through my nose. It was pulled over and crammed out so hard and only one nostril. This, everything not covered was blown off my head. Everything covered remained with enough skin to grow back, but not over here. Well, on operation number 50, 12 hours of surgery with nine doctors, three teams of three working on me. They built me a nose. Isn't it beautiful? I'm so proud of it. It's a boy. And I have lips again. And I, I'm making a point of myself. Please forgive me if you think I can't speak without talking about me. But me is the illustration of this message. I am the illustration of my own message. Look, eyelids again. Those of you that knew me years back, no eyelids. My lips were so gone. My mouth was inverted. I drooled all the time. And my nose was... Look at me today. People tell me everywhere I go, Oh, Dave, you're looking good. But there's one thing that they never say. Oh, Dave, you're good looking. <laughs> and what a difference that makes. I'm not trying to be good looking. I'm just glad to have a nose. I'm glad to have my lips back. I'm glad to have my eyelids. You know, the people that don't know and they look at me and, and they have no idea. No idea. Forty something years ago, I bought my first airplane and I went in kind of a business of owning and and repairing and building aircraft, rebuilding aircraft, so that I could sell them and try to make enough money to pay for the aircraft so that I never asked the ministry to pay for it. I've owned a lot of jets. And I remember when I started out my first flight, why did I buy that airplane? I walked into a public place one day and a little, little girl looked up at me and she screamed and hid behind mommy's skirt, screaming, mommy, what is it, what is it? It was the most embarrassing thing I'd ever had happen. For the year and two months, I was at Brook Army Medical Center, 60 surgeries ago. For that first series of operations, 13 of them in that year and two months, I was surrounded by people that looked just like me in, in essence. All of us were hurt, some with no face, some with no hands, some with no arms or legs. 
all kinds of parts missing, but we all had something wrong that put us in the same category so that if nothing was wrong with you, something wasn't right. Does that make any sense? If something's not right, then I'm comfortable. But if everything is where, it's ought, where it ought to be, then I'm not comfortable. So I didn't want to fly publicly because I scared so many children. So I bought an airplane, flew jets for 40 years. They made my, made my nose and lips and eyelids. And I looked in the mirror after it was all done. Now, I immediately following the surgery, I thought I'd never speak publicly again. It's the worst thing I'd ever seen in my life since my original injury. Oh, it was horrible. It looked like a truck backed up over me and made sure they got me so they pulled forward over me and then dumped the garbage on me. It was horrible. And if you think I'm understating it, you haven't seen the pictures and I'm not going to show them to you. Some of you would throw up in the seat you're in right now. You couldn't handle it. Oh, I didn't either. I went into a dark place of depression. 40-something years, almost 50 years after my injury, and I'm facing that darkness again because I'm as human as you are. I was in that valley of weeping, that valley of sorrow, that valley of pain, that valley of baka. I can't promise you you'll never be in one again. I can't promise you we'll never have another pandemic either. All I can tell you is whatever valley you're in, don't stop, put up a tent and live there. For heaven's sake, pass through that valley. Keep your eyes on the target. Keep your eyes on the goal. And don't be discouraged by those naysayers around you who never have anything hopeful to say. Read the word of God and find hope in it because Jesus, I've had people tell me, I read the end of the book. So did I. So what do you mean? I read the end of the book, we win. Well, I read the middle of the book and we win. I read the beginning of the book and we win. In fact, from Genesis to Revelation, we win. So what's the problem, baby? Why do we sit around moping and complaining and groping in the darkness trying to find a ray of light? That ray of light is you. You are the hope of this world, the salt and light, the preservative and the light to pathway, to a light to the pathway so people can see where they're going. They'll follow you if nothing else. I hope I'm making some sense because I'm going to tell you, I know what that darkness is. And those tragedies upon tragedies that God has turned to triumph in my life and I I don't have any more of God than you do. I'm not better than you are. He doesn't love me more than he loves you. So if I can make it, you can make it. I'm passing through a valley of darkness, but I'm coming out the other side. And it says in that last verse 7 that they go from strength to strength. Every one of them appeareth before God in Zion. What does that mean? As you do what I'm about to tell you, if you'll do this, you'll never be without water. Let me point it out to you. The rain fills the pools. What does that mean? That means wherever you set your foot and make an imprint in the dirt, the rain comes and that footprint, if that's all you've left, is proof that you were there. Just that tiny little impression of about a half an inch, it might hold water long enough to capture a a seed floating in the wind and that seed land in that water, sprout its little tiny roots, grab a few grains of sand, and next thing you know, you've got a plant, and then it will reproduce itself in many ways, and it ends up being an oasis in the desert. Why? Because as you pass through the Valley of Becca, they make it a spring, or as it says in the King James original, they dig a well. What does the commercial say? American Express Get that card and don't leave home without it. I got something I'm going to tell you that's more important to not leave home, and that's a shovel. Take a shovel wherever you go. Be a well digger wherever you go. That's what first responders do. They bring hope. They bring life. They bring a second chance to people that are in such distress. There's no way they're going to pull through this without your help, first responders. Those that defend our lives and those that save our lives, without you, we don't have a life. So you're well diggers, but there's something you ought to know about well diggers. And as ministers of the gospel, what do you think, what do you really think Pastor Jim is? I'll tell you what he is. And pastor of your local chapel, there. you know what they are? They're well diggers. That's exactly what they are, well diggers. There's something about them we should know. Number one, they're not always the best dressed. I mean, they come out in old dungarees and overalls and the smell of that old nasty clay that smells about half rotten coming up out of the ground. And they don't drive the prettiest equipment. You get so ugly and dirty, and they're just not your fashion statement of the day. What is a well digger? 
It's a hardworking guy that's not afraid to get sweaty and nasty because he's got an ultimate goal, and that ultimate goal is the secret of life. You cannot live without water. You can go 30 days. I've done it. I've gone 31 days with nothing but water, water only, not one drop of any kind of juice or anything with flavor, not one grain of any kind of wheat or, or kernel of corn, nothing in my mouth for 31 days. I did fine until the 31st day, and I fainted and passed out, and a first responder saved my life. I was trying to do a 30-day fast for God to show him that I loved him more than I did myself. That's really what it amounted to. I wasn't trying to lose weight, but I did. I lost 85 pounds. I like to kill myself doing it. But I made my point, and the point is this. During those 30 days of commitment to Christ, I had water only, and it was sufficient. You can go a long time without food. You know how long you can go without water? About three days, and then you're going to die. You cannot live without water. Fluid has to get into your body. So why well diggers? Why not barbecue chefs? <laughs> you know, why not the wiener truck come by and give you a weenie? Why not? I'm going to tell you why. Because water flows from the throne of God. The illustration of life in that water is what I'm trying to make a point of. We are well diggers. I had a well dug at our place where we live now. This is before we built our home. And I didn't even know who to call, so I just opened the yellow pages. We had nothing out there, just electrical and a little travel trailer that we had hooked up. It had its own water tank, but no well, no septic tanks, nothing, just a power pole. But I had a telephone, and I called, and I said, uh, I'm looking for all red well digging service. And the voice on the end said, yes. I said, okay, uh, may I speak to Mr. Allred? Is this Mr. Allred? Yes. I said, I, I need a well. He said, where? I said, well, it's out on 10 Mile Bridge Road, 9430 10 Mile Bridge Road. He said, when? Boy, this is really a brilliant conversation, right? So I told him, I need it as soon as you can get out here. I hung up. My wife looked at me and she said, what, did you, did you get a well digger? I said, I don't know. I think I did. She said, well, when is he coming? I said, I don't know. She said, well, what are we going to do? I said, I'm going to go up and wait up at the road and see the, the paved road and see if I can identify him and wave him down. Well, about three hours later, I see this white truck coming down. It's an old, rusted old truck. The side door had something to do with well digging service, but it was red paint that had faded to a light pink, and you could barely read it. He had buckets hanging off the both sides of that thing, pipes coming out the front and back of it. I thought, my Lord, the, I got Jed Clampett's coming to dig me a well, <laughs> and he bounced on our property. Buckets fell off. He rolled to a stop because he didn't have any brakes. He said, where do you want this well? I about fainted. I thought, my goodness, he actually spoke a whole sentence. I said, well, it's wonderful to see you. I said, I don't know where to get that, that stick thing out you doing. Find me some water. He said, well, better yet, why don't we find out where you're going to build your house so we put the well close to it. I thought, well, that's smart. He's smarter than I thought. I said, well, let's build a house over here and we'll put the well next to it. He started digging. Pipe after pipe was added. He went down 350 feet and hit what's called the third level of the Trinity River in the great county of Tarrant. He hit water and he pulled some of that water up. It was so cold and fresh it made the tin cup sweat on that hot July day. And I took a mouthful of that water. That's the best tasting water I ever. I looked at him and his old dungarees. I looked at his old truck and all the buckets. I said, you know what, Mr. Allred? Whatever your garment is, that's a fine suit of clothes. I don't know who you got them from, but they look good on you. And I don't know about that equipment, but that's the finest equipment I've ever seen. I don't know if you're following me, but if you are, don't judge the book by the cover. Don't look at me and say, well, he's a messed up Vietnam vet. We lived that down years ago. Don't look at me and say, well, he's war torn. He's probably got PTSD. No, I don't. Don't look at me and say, I can't win because I'm disfigured. Oh, I do look good today. I do look good. But you have to understand, it's not the outer appearance that matters. That well digger spirit that's within me never gets old. My body's 73. My mind is 23. And I, I have no intention of getting older. My spirit will never die. How do you put age on something that's eternal? So you may be older in your body, but don't let the world know it. 
fake it. Be young all your life till you die of old age. I hope this is making sense to you because I am a fountain of water. You are a fountain of the water of life that flows from the throne of God. And in this old wicked world that's going through this valley of great depression and a pandemic, be a ray of light. Be a hopeful voice. Walk up to people you know are hurting and just encourage them because I can tell you now, if you don't encourage them, you will discourage them. I remember one time I walked into a church and the greeter, I guess that's what you'd call him, not at Walmart, but at a church. The minute I walked up, hi, Brother Dave. It was already a downer just to hear his voice. I said, how you doing? He took my hand and put it on his back and he said, feel that lump back there? I said, yeah. He said, that thing hurts so bad today. I just have, I, and, and Brother Dave, if you, if you push a little bit, you see, oh, oh, that hurts. When I walked away from him, I reached back, and you know what? I think I had one of those bumps too. And I pushed, oh, it hurt. I don't know if it's psychosomatic or what, but I can tell you this. You be a downer to people, they'll walk away down in their spirit. Don't go spreading fear. Spread faith. Be a light in their world of darkness. They don't call me to go into the Middle East as a DOD contractor because I'm good looking. Department of Defense didn't call me because I'm a mighty man of military strength. They didn't call me because of my academic achievements. Folks, I was in the top 10% of the lower one third of my class. And most people don't get that. Five out of four don't understand fractions anyway. <laughs> and if you didn't get that, you must have been in my class of the top 10% of the lower one third. Have I confused you? Well, let me blow away this, the fog of war. That hand grenade I was holding was white phosphorus that burns at 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It blew six inches from my face from a bullet through the back of my hand, detonating it by a sniper who put me in his crosshairs. That day I'll never forget. Uniquely, unbelievably, I never passed out. The concussion should have killed me alone. The damage done was enough to kill me. Anything over 30% third degree burn in those days was absolutely fatal. I was 50% third degree, a little bit less than that actually, but it, it, more skin died as time went along. So it ended up, I lost about half my skin. Blinded in the right eye, blew my ear off, blew my face off, blew my eyelids off, blew my hair off. I got my hair back. <laughs> I bought it. So I can tell you that I don't mind the hair piece, but I hate chasing across church parking lots on windy Sundays. I don't mind the plastic ear, but it falls off when I'm preaching sometimes. I was in Jamaica on one occasion it fell off. They're going nuts. Their eyes are wide. They're sucking air like a hoover, covering their mouth, pointing at me. I checked my fly. I didn't know something was wrong. I didn't know what was wrong. And then I look around. There's my ear laying on my shoulder. I picked it up, stuck it back on. I thought, well, that's settled. Oh, no. It got worse. They thought it was a miracle, and they all got saved. So it ended up getting better. So what's my point? There's not a thing in this world the devil or this world can do to you that God can't turn around and use it against them. I'll put it this way. The devil took a stick on the 26th of July, 1969, on the bank of the Vam Cote River on the border with Cambodia, deep in the jungle of Vietnam. He took that stick and he beat me severely around the head and shoulders. Then he made a fatal error. <laughs> he threw down the stick and he walked off laughing. What's fatal? I crawled over and picked up that same stick. I used it to get back on my feet. I lifted that stick above my head and I said, devil, you come back here. This war's not over. And I took that same stick and I'm beating him all over the face of this earth with the stick he beat me with. I got that from a friend of mine. His name is Jesus. They used two sticks on him and they made a cross and they crucified him. They killed him. They took his life, put him in a cave and sealed it with a stone. And on the third day, the seal broke, the stone was rolled away. And the very stick that they killed him with, that cross of Calvary is lifted high today, beating the devil all over the face of the earth with it. Come on, you know I'm right. And you know what I'm saying to you is your light in your world of darkness. All of this fear, all of this panic, all of this uncertainty, it's all available to you to use against the devil that's trying to beat you with it. Turn the tables on him. You young people, there is a tomorrow. There is a future. You're not going to die of a pandemic. You're going to be just fine. I don't think this pandemic could be any more deadly to me than a hand grenade explosion beside my head. And if I can make it, you can make it. 
And with half my skin blown off my body, you got to understand, I was open to every infection known to mankind, I guess. And yet during my entire recovery at Brook Army Medical Center for one year and two months, I don't recall ever having a single infection. And see what they do. They take you fresh off the battlefield, picked me up by helicopter, flew me to a little place, a little what they call MASH. You remember the, the MASH programs? It was a MASH unit. And from there, they did in there, they did emergency surgery, and then they sent me to Saigon to the bigger hospital in Vietnam. And from there, they put me on a big jet and flew me to Japan. I asked for a mirror, and they brought me one. We were both wrong. I shouldn't have asked, and they shouldn't have brought it. They held it over my face with my good eye. My left eye looked up, and I saw what was left. Everything over here was skull, and I knew there's no teenage girl on the face of yours could love a monster like that. So I took it out of God's hands, and I took it out of my sweet wife's hands. We married young. She was 13 when I asked her to marry me. I was 16. She slapped me and said, if I loved her, I'd wait. So I did. She graduated 18 years old, and I'm now 20 at that point. We got married. Her handsome young prince turned into the frog that day on the bank of that river. And the promise I made before I left her, I said, I'll be back without a scar and I can still taste the salt on my lips when I kiss those tears off her face. But when I said I'd be back without a scar, I knew I'd made a promise I couldn't keep. And that day when I looked in that mirror, my promise given was now a promise broken. I didn't want her to see me. I didn't want to take the chance that I might live and they would send me home and she would see me the way I had become from what I had been. And I decided to take it away from all those that love me, that hope. And I tried to kill myself. How do you kill yourself when every tube in your body is keeping you alive? You pull the tube out. I unplugged it, laid my head back, folded my hands, and I waited to die. Deep in the darkness of the valley of sorrow. But the rest of the story, as we say, Paul Harvey, you got to hear. I waited to die and ended up getting hungry. Huh, I pulled the wrong tube. Yes, I did. I'm glad. If I'd pulled the right tube, I might have died. You see, I really didn't want to die. But it was so dark and it seemed so hopeless. And my last line of defense called hope was gone that she could ever love me. And if she can't love me, how could God love me? And so I ended up getting hungry, and that was not my life dripping on the floor. That was my lunch dripping on the floor out of the tube I pulled out of my system. And I'm going to tell you a little secret. The angel of the Lord encamped around about me that day, and in my morbid confusion, God saved my life from my own hand. They sent me to America, to Brook Army Medical Center. And as I said, I was there for a year and two months. But I want to share the closing thoughts with you about what happened there. Two of the biggest events of my life. I'm going to share the second one first. The second event was that they put me in what's called the ICU. That's the, the death row for Brook Army Medical Center. They had 13 of us in there. We were nicknamed the Baker's Dozen. All 13 of us were put in that intensive care unit to die. If we died on the main ward, it depressed other patients. So they put us in there to die. I didn't know what the ICU even meant until after many months they let me stand up and put a robe on me. It didn't come together in the back. You know how they don't come? <laughs> I called it the ICU. And I'm going to tell you, I saw me and I didn't like it. The ICU was death row. That's what we nicknamed it. And in that unit, they allowed visitors one at a time. The guy in the bed next to mine was 100% third degree. I was almost 50. Anything over 30%, remember? It's a death warrant. You don't live. We were all to die. And she walked in to this man who had no hope. I had what's called TBI, brain damage from the damage of the explosion. He had a flash fire, took off his skin, but didn't damage his internal organs or his brain. And I'll tell you, you think, well, he might live. No, nobody lives with no skin. If he had even a partial second degree burn, he had a chance. But it was all third degree, no skin at all. He's guaranteed to die. He's kept only alive by those tubes. And his wife walked in, took off her wedding ring and threw it on his bed. And she said, you're embarrassing. I couldn't walk down the street with you. I heard it. And that's all I need to know. 
There's a teenage girl coming out next and she's going to take one look at me and that wedding ring's coming off. And my greatest fear, when she looks at me as I knew she would when I was still in Japan, I knew she'd see me and I knew she couldn't handle it. That woman walked out on her husband and he died. Another woman walked into her husband, stood at the foot of my bed, a little teenage girl, picked up the pad that had my name on it. She said to the attending doctor, that's not my husband, but I was. And one eye peeking out at her, there's no way she could love this. She walked to the head of the bed, looked at me and looked into my good eye and saw something she recognized. They say the eyes are the windows of the soul. So I'm going to tell you straight. She looked into my soul. She saw what scars and burns could not take away. She saw something alive in the spirit of the man that was so nearly dead. She said, Doc, this is Dave. And she bent down and kissed what was left of my face. Look me in my good eye. And she said, I just want you to know I really love you. Welcome home, Davey. And when she says, Davey, I always say, hey, 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 Bubba, I was home. I wasn't dead yet. I said, Brenda, I'm sorry. Why would I be sorry? You see, I made a promise. I'll be back without a scar. And I broke it. Now she's stuck with a monster. I said, I'm sorry. She said, why? I said, I can't ever look good for you. She said, Davey, you never were good looking anyhow. I hope you're listening. You see, you're judging the book by the cover. You got it all wrong. We are so body oriented. We forget we have a living soul and a spirit within that living soul when you know Christ. We call it body, soul, and spirit, but God calls it spirit, soul, and body in order of priority. So today, first responders and those to whom those first responders respond to, take hope. In this time of darkness, turn on the light of love and hope and be alive in a pandemic when people are dying and people are struggling and, oh, I could go on and on with all that negativity, but you're the light of the world, the salt of the earth. Let's fulfill our predestined goal as believers that we would bring hope to a hopeless world. Oh, yes, that first event. So I'm going to take you back to when that airplane landed at Lackland Air Force Base out of Japan. That Lackland Air Force Base is in San Antonio. It was a long flight from Japan. And I got there and I was almost dead. I was so worn out just from the flight. They put me on a stretcher and put me into a helicopter and flew me over to Brook Army Medical Center. Put me back on a stretcher and took me into what was called the debridement room. We called it hell. You remember the place they kept us called death row? Hell is where they took us to from death row. It had a Hubble tank about the size, of maybe three times the size of a regular tub. Six attendants, three on each side, reached over that stainless steel tub and they ministered to those of us in those tanks. What they did was they lowered your body into just enough to keep your face out of the water so you could breathe. And then they'd splash that water gently on all your burns to soften the charcoal. Did you hear me? To soften the charcoal. Half my body was covered in charcoal. They could break it off. They could scrape it off. They could fillet it off, which they did most of the time. I remember here pieces of me falling into a metal garbage can. When they cut my ear, what was left of it off, what was left of a piece of thumb, they cut it off and they threw it in the trash. And I'm thinking, that's part of me. I was born with that. They can't drug you enough to take the pain away. And if they put you to sleep, they have to do this every day. You go into sleep state called a coma and you don't want to be in coma. You don't want that because you sometimes never wake up. So they're caught between rock and a hard spot, grit your teeth and bear it but you can't bear it. You'll go insane. I did. They're cutting on me and throwing pieces of me in the garbage and I lost my mind, literally. I reached up and grabbed one of the women by the hair of her head and I flipped her clear into the tank with me. I was trying to save my life because I thought she was trying to take my life. I had her face down in the tank of water. Now she was okay. 
not three seconds passed, I'm quite sure, before the other five attendants had her back out of that tank. She dried her face, wiped her hands, and I looked up at her, and my skin was in her hair. Her uniform was now pink, not white, mixed with my diluted blood. When they said he's had enough, I agreed. They put me on a gurney and sent me from hell to death row. And on the way to death row, I was on a gurney with a wobbly wheel that sounded very much like a Walmart sharpened cut. And the medic said something I didn't want to hear anymore, and I wanted to hear that wobbly wheel. He said, in the morning at 8.30, we're going to do this again. And I looked up at him off that gurney, and I said, not you, not the entire United States Army is big enough to put me back in that tank. You'll never hurt me like that again. What am I talking about, people? Do you get it? I'm talking about the valley of weeping. That valley of sorrow. I was deep in it that day. And when I said, you'll never hurt me like that again, I wasn't saying he didn't have the power to do it. I was saying, I'll kill myself, and then I can't feel what you do to me again. And I was so wrong. And he was wrong when he said, okay, okay, you'll die then. And I said to myself, that's what I want. But I said to him, okay, then let's negotiate this. If you're going to do this to me again at 8 morning and 8.30, don't tell me. Surprise me. Like you did today. I didn't know you were going to do this to me today. Tomorrow, don't tell me. But it's too late. Now I know. So I'm going to be awake all night with anxiety attacks, knowing hell's coming on a blue draped gurney to pick me up in death row and take me to a place I don't want to go. And I was right. 8.30 the next morning, I heard that wobbly wheel come down the corridor being pushed by that medic. Actually, three of them following him. And they got to the room we called death row and pushed the gurney up beside the bed but forgot to lock the wheels. And when they got on each end of the blue sheets of my bed and they started to swing me over, one of them dropped me on the foot end, then the other dropped me on the foot end. My body hit at an angle, and the jar just stunned me with pain. And I got my elbows out, one on the bed and one on the gurney, and it's opening up like a knife blade, and I'm falling through, and I'm slipping, and I'm about to fall through the cracks of life. This is going to leave a mark. I didn't want it. It was going to hurt. And my life took a drastic change. He was six foot seven, solid muscle, 350 pounds at least. When he moved, cannonballs popped up on those shoulders, that chest and on those arms. He reached a hand underneath me, and this tall, black, bald man, whose name was Rosie, would lift me up from a deathbed I'm certain would have been that day. He put an arm under the back of my head, and I stiffened my neck, realizing it would give him leverage. And with his other hand, he reached down, picked up my entire body like a featherweight, I was in the arms of somebody who would carry me, not put me on a gurney, down that long corridor to a place I didn't want to go. He put me in that tank of water, retracted those forklift of arms, backpedaled, folded them, stood up against the wall, and they started filleting me, cutting me, breaking off charcoal of me. Out of the corner of my eyes, I'm shaking and only my heels and back of my head touching in that Hubble tank. I'm grasping for hair and I'm looking over and to my shock and amazement, that black skin, that beautiful ebony skin reflecting those streams of tears look like little fire streams reflecting that morning sunrise. Oh my, his lips were moving. Rosie was praying for me. I felt strength flowing into my body. He was giving me water from the well. He dug in my valley of sorrow. When I'd taken all I could, he reached in that water and picked me up. And on his way back to my death row, he said over and over and over with every step, you'll be fine, big man, you'll see, you'll be fine. You'll be fine, big man. You'll see. You'll be fine. I don't know how many times he said it, but it was enough for me to finally believe him. And when he laid me in my bed, he turned and faced me and reached up and touched the top of my head where a little piece of hair somehow survived. 
He stroked it with a mother's love, looking into my pupils of my eyes, and I looked into his, and I think I saw Jupiter and Mars, the sun, the moon, the stars. Who was this man? He said one more time, you'll be fine, big man, you'll see, and then he did something I've never let a man do. He kissed the top of my head right on the forehead, and he turned around and walked out. End of story, almost. I'm down to the wire. Fast forward 20 years to the great state of Oregon. It's the 4th of July, Redmond Airport. It's the Air National Guard asked me to join the 4th of July celebration, and there were 20,000 people came to hear me speak. I was in heaven. I finished the standing ovations. It was so much fun. And as they dispersed, a woman walked up and stood right in front of me. No big screen TVs, and I think what she said was, you're Dave, right? And I'm thinking, yes, there was no big screen TV for her to identify me if she was at the back of the crowd. And I thought, yes, I'm Dave. So I said, yes, ma'am. But I didn't know why she asked that. I think she knew I was. She said, but that's your nickname. Your real name's David. I said, yes, ma'am. Anybody would know that's not Bartholomew with the nickname of Dave. And so I said, yes, ma'am. She said, that's your middle name and your first name's Milton. Oh, how does she know that? She said, it's Milton David Reaver. I said, yes, ma'am. Who are you? She said with a wry smile, I'm the nurse you dragged into the tank that day at Brook Army Medical Center. I was so embarrassed. I literally, my scar tissue blushed. I said, madam, I am sorry. I don't think I ever apologize. She said, you don't have to. I thought it was you. I just wanted to be sure, but I didn't recognize you with your clothes on. Oh, my word. I thought, don't say that again. Don't say it out loud. We laughed till we were in tears. And then I remembered Rosie. I said, Madam, do you remember a guy named Rosie? If I tapped her on the head with a two by four, she buckled, blinked, and came out of a trance. It looked like, I haven't thought of him in years, she said. I asked her, do you know where he is? She said, no. I said, do you know where he came from? She said, no. I said, do you know what his real name was? She said, well, all I remember is Rosie, and he had a tattoo on his arm. I said, yes, that's him. You don't remember him? She said, I remember everything, but I don't know where he is. I said, when did he come to Brook Army Medical Center? She said, when you did. You know my next question. When did he leave? I said, she said to me, when you left, and I'm going to say this to you, Rosie was more than a male nurse to me. He was more than someone rescuing me from a fire and the burns of that fire. Rosie was a first responder. So I'm going to ask something of you today as I close. Don't just be another person. Be something a cut above a special person. Be a rosy to somebody today. Be a first responder to someone in the valley of sorrow because they're killing themselves all over America, around the world. Losing hope. Bring hope. Bring water. Dig a well. Be a rosy. Maybe you'll be the very first responder in their time of darkness. Thank you for letting me share my heart. I'm Dave Reaver. I approved of this message.
Tower, good afternoon. Angel Flight Bravo 03. Gear down, five miles. We have a hero on board tonight. Angel Flight Bravo 02, you are number one for landing. Welcome home.